Please be seated. We'll hear argument in 2517, U.S. Bank National Association against Walsh. May it please the Court, Mr. Cradigal will present argument for the petitioners. Petitioners have reserved five minutes for rebuttal. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, Chris Cradigal on behalf of the petitioners, U.S. Bank Association, U.S. Bank National Association, I'm joined by my colleague, Adam Nunley. In 2007, Your Honor, the Texas legislature took decisive action to cure the historic and reoccurring problem of default judgments against banks and other financial institutions in Texas by passing Section 17.028 of the Civil Practice and Remedies Code. Now, Section 17.028 was designed to end a practice that had evolved wherein a plaintiff suing a bank or financial institution would serve a bank officer because under the prior law it was permissible to serve a bank through any bank officer in any branch. They would find a junior officer at an outlying branch and hope that they didn't timely relay the suit papers to the legal department back at headquarters and thereby allowing an aggressive plaintiff's counsel to take a default judgment. Section 17.028 was designed by the legislature to end this practice by mandating that the service of process on a bank or other financial institution be made by, through its registered agent or if the bank lacks a registered agent through a branch president or branch manager at an office located within the state. So the legislature amended the Civil Practice and Remedies Code to establish a specific service scheme on banks and on its face um, that appears to be mandatory. We'll get to that text momentarily as to why I believe 17.028 to be the mandatory mode of service on banks and financial institutions in this state. But the goal of the legislation was to allow a bank to sleep well at night knowing it had a registered agent in the state of Texas to receive service of process and to put an end to the sorts of surprise default judgments that had characterized an earlier era of Texas law. Well, lawyers are nothing if not creative, and while 17.028 did solve the problem of service on junior officers in, in remote branches, a new problem has manifested itself. In this case and, and several others... a new problem, Mr. Cradbell, I think the... Um that what's now in the Estates Code is back from the 1960s originally, I think, uh, when that provision was first enacted, and then it was reenacted in the Estates Code after 17028 was passed. Uh, and also, it's my understanding that, seven, that the legislation that added 17028 repealed certain language in the Finance Code regarding service. So why shouldn't we presume, in light of that history, that the legislature intended to leave the requirements of the estates code in place? Oh, just because we had, as an initial matter, you're quite correct that the language in the estates code dates from 1961, and again, an earlier era of Texas law, where out-of-state financial institutions were being allowed into the state for the purpose of serving as, as a trust or another fiduciary capacities to estates. Uh, it is not a broad, general uh, service statute of general applicability. That's where 17.028 comes in. And, and I think to answer your more fundamental question about the interplay between Section 505.004 of the Estates Code, because you're, you're quite correct, the former Probate Code 105A has now been codified at Estates Code 505.004A. We, we have to start uh, by engaging with the text of 17.028. And when we do that, I think we see a mandatory scheme. And I'll start with uh, 17.028B, which starts with the, the first phrase that gives us a clue that we're dealing with a mandatory scheme. It says, except as provided by subsection C. That means there's a carve-out for subsection C, a limited carve-out for credit unions, which are obviously a special type, a different type of financial institution, in subsection C. So, except as provided in subsection C, subsection B is universally applicable. And it goes on to say, citation may be served on a financial institution by, and it lists the 
the two provisions that I've already mentioned, the service for a registered agent or service through a bank uh, a branch president or manager. Um, I'm sure counsel opposite will, uh, very capable lawyer, talk about May there. Uh, in an ideal world, I will concede I would rather have shall than may uh, in that statute, but I don't think that liberates us from that introductory clause except as provided by subsection C, which hints, indicates the mandatory nature of, of subsection B except for the carve-out. More fundamentally and more importantly, the second indicia of the mandatory nature of 17.028 is found in subsection D. If citation has not been properly served as provided by this section, a financial institution may maintain an action to set aside the default judgment or any sanctions entered against the financial institution. This establishes a right that if service is not made pursuant to this section on a bank or other financial institution, that bank can seek uh, a set aside of that default judgment. Again, if we agree with you about that, then why isn't service under Section 505.004? Uh, why is it service on the, uh, the appointed agent for service of process, rather, that was appointed under 505.004, service on a, quote, registered agent under B1 of 17.028? Well, I, th I think that gets a little more into the facts of this specific case rather than the raw, broad rule of, of law in the interplay between the, the two statutes. But, but I'll, t I'll take a shot at that, uh, Your Honor. I think there's, there's two things going on in the record related to U.S. Bank. First is found at Clerk's Record 75, which is a May 22, 2013 letter uh, uh, from the bank to the Secretary of State designating CT Corporation as the bank's registered agent for service of the process. Uh, this, this case is filed several years later, so this uh, letter on May uh, of 2013 well predates this case. So as of the filing of this case, and at all points relevant to this case, the Secretary of State was aware, and, and uh, petitioner or Respondent's Counsel easily could have been aware of the identity of the registered agent for service of process in this state. And if you flip one page in the clerk's record, take a look, look at clerk's record, page 76, there is a second uh, letter in which the uh, Secretary of State acknowledges the update of the address of the registered agent for service process for U.S. Bank, which is CT Corporation, the company whose business is serving as a registered agent for service process, and accepting service of process for large companies like U.S. Bank in an effort to prevent exactly these sorts of default judgments. So are you arguing that the, the Secretary of State should have also treated that as an update of the of the person that's been uh, appointed under 505-004 to pay to? I, I am, Your Honor. I think there is adequate notice given to the Secretary of State. In this case, the bank made a good faith and reasonable effort to make clear that it was had CT Corp as its registered agent for service of process, as, as many large companies and many large banks do. And the next hint that we get in the record um, that uh, the Secretary of State uh, should have been aware of this and Respondent's Counsel should have been aware of this is at uh, Clerk's Record 73, which is the return of process um, where the Secretary of State acknowledges that the seat papers sent on March 21st, 2017, so four years after the designation of CT Corp., um, was returned was returned to sender. It's the old Elvis Presley song, No Such Number, uh, Address Unknown. Um, so between the multiple designations of CT Corp as the registered agent for service process, which is publicly available, and the return address unknown, no such number, uh, when they attempted to serve the former uh, 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 registered agent, um, I think the, the, the bank behaved uh, very reasonably and within the contemplation of, of the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure and the Civil Practice and Remedies Code. But again, Justice Busby, this is my point that 17.028 was designed to prevent exactly this sort of scenario and to allow a bank or other financial institution to sleep well at night knowing that it had properly appointed a designated agent for service of process in this state. And, and I took that to be the argument from your, your brief, but 
which only presents a single issue, but I, I forgive me if I missed it, but I didn't understand from your brief that you were also arguing that the Secretary of State should have treated that designation as effective under 505-004-A2. I, I thought the argument was that, that 505-004 does not apply and rather 17-028 applies exclusively. I, I, that is one argument we certainly make, Your Honor. I would say that there are three ways the court could reconcile these two statutes. The first way the court could reconcile those two statutes is what the Court of Appeals for El Paso did in the Bank of New York v. Chesapeake case, where it simply held, and that's now been followed by, by the Tyler Court of Appeals more recently uh, in a supplemental authority letter that I've, I've submitted to the court, uh, where those two courts of appeals have ruled that 17.028 is the exclusive means of serving a financial institution. Um, under the Texas uh, Civil Practice and, and Remedies Code, under, under Texas law. The second way these two statutes could interplay is if there is a carve-out, just as there's a limited carve-out from 17.028B in subsection C, there's another carve-out for estate-related cases. Uh, 505.004A is in the estate code for a reason. That reason is it's not a generally applicable service statute. It's not meant for service in all scenarios. There's no estate. Just following up on that, does the bank act, by holding a deed of trust, does the bank act in a fiduciary capacity with respect to the mortgage debtor? So the bank is here in a, a trustee capacity uh, insofar as it is the trustee for a pool of investors who invested in these uh, pooled mortgage uh, mortgages. So that is, when the bank refers to itself as a trust, that's what the bank is referring to. But there's no underlying estate proceeding, Your Honor. There's no corpus delecti, if you will. There is well, I'm just trying to figure out, vis-a-vis -vis the, the plaintiff in this case, the mortgage debtor, is, is the bank acting in a fiduciary capacity on behalf of the mortgage debtor? Your, Your Honor, I'm, I'm going to defer to Mr. Donnelly, who's my expert on that. Um, uh, there is no fiduciary relationship between the bank there and the debtor. There are lots of court of appeals cases that say that, that, that the, the bank is the holder of the deed of trust doesn't act in a fiduciary capacity on behalf of the debtor. Your Honor, yeah, you're absolutely correct. The fiduciary relationship is between the, the bank and the investors in this pool of securities. So there is not only no estate proceeding here, but no fiduciary relationship between these parties. So it's really taking a limited uh, statute, which is designed for fiduciaries for estates, uh, and trying to make it into a general purpose statute. It's the new way of making an end run around 17.028. Um, Except that 505004 doesn't seem to limit itself to uh, people in a fiduciary relationship. It just says an action or proceeding related to a trust, estate, fund, or other matter. So doesn't this relate to a trust? Justice Busby, we can't let that section become the exception that swallows the rule. And I'm afraid that's what that reading and what the reading from the Dallas Court of Appeals would do. Most of the actions banks take, many of the actions, are in a fiduciary or trustee or similar capacity. And 505.004, if given that reading and read uh, uh, sort of with equal standing to 17.028, would swallow the rule. So does that mean the bank would have to deposit certain assets in order uh, that, that Section 505 would otherwise exempt it from depositing? I mean, that was the purpose of what's now a state's code, Chapter 505, is you don't have to go through the onerous requirement of depositing a bunch of assets uh, to be available for claims. Uh, but uh, in turn, you have to designate an agent. And so if they don't have to designate an agent, do they then have to comply with those other provisions of the finance code? Your Honor, um, um, I'll confess that goes a bit beyond the scope of the argument here in that there is no dispute. Like that's the trade-off. Well, that's what I'm getting to is, is the trade-off was, okay, well, it's going to be easier to serve you, but but we're not going to make you comply with all of these these onerous requirements for um, doing business in Texas. And so, um, you know, deposit of securities and that sort of thing. So I'm just wondering if you sort of have to take the bitter with the sweet on that. Well, I, I think 17.028 envisions a simplified service scheme on financial institutions. I'm, my, my client, in this case, is undisputed at all times relevant to this proceeding, had a registered agent, and I'm willing to bet that virtually every 
out-of-state financial institution that does business in Texas has CT Corporation or a similar registered agent in reliance on 17.028. Um, and to the extent that someone fails to designate a registered agent, then there's uh, sub, you know, subsection B, part two, which is go serve the branch manager, go serve the branch president. So it's, it does not create a difficulty in serving out-of-state financial institutions. It actually creates, a, I think, an a elegantly simple process that they made an end run around in an effort to get a default judgment. It's a remarkable re reversal of fortune to go from being on the cusp of foreclosure and defaulting on a mortgage to being out from under that mortgage and having a free house. And I see my, my time is up. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Credo. We'll Thank hear you. from the respondent. May it please the court. Mr. Harder will present argument for the respondent. Thank you, uh, Chief Justice. May it please the court. Thank you for the opportunity of hearing our thoughts this morning on this case. The issue presented by a U.S. bank who appears before the court not in its individual capacity, but as trustee for the Residential Asset Mortgage Products, Inc. Mortgage Asset Backed Pass-Through Certificate Series uh, 2005-EFC2. The question presented is, did the district court err by allowing service on U.S. Bank as trustee under the estate's code instead of requiring service under the uh, Civil Practice and Remedies Code, Chapter 17028. I would submit to the court that based on the analysis of the court below, uh, Justice Whitehouse's opinion in this case and Judge Fitzwater's opinion on the remand that is in the record as well as uh, cited in my brief, there's not an inconsistency between 17028 and 505004. Um, when you examine the statutory schemes in uh, both the Civil Practice and Remedies Code and in the Estates Code, when you examine the language, when you examine the legislative history, the conclusion that I think is mandated is the conclusion that was arrived at first by Judge Fitzwater, uh, whose reasoning was adopted by the Second Court of Appeals in the NSL case, that was again adopted by uh, the Fifth Court of Appeals in this case below. U.S. Bank in 1961 filed its application for authority to act as a foreign fiduciary with the Texas Secretary of State, pursuant to what was then the newly enacted Probate Code Section 105A. According to their paperwork, and that paperwork is before the court, it was made an exhibit to the uh, original petition. The Secretary of State was irrevocably appointed as the registered agent for service of process in cases where U.S. Bank was being served and sued in its capacity as a fiduciary. In that designation... Is the plaintiff, or, is the plaintiff in this case, a beneficiary of a, a, a trust or an estate? No. And, and so is the bank acting in a fiduciary capacity with respect to the plaintiff? Not with respect to the plaintiff, but with respect to the holders of the securities. So with these mortgage-backed pools, you've got a depositor, the originators of loans or holders of loans, that put them into a trust, and they transfer title to those loans to U.S. Bank. So U.S. Bank was acting as a fiduciary, not with respect to Dennis Moss, but with respect to the certificate holders of the residential asset, the products, the mortgage, trust, yada, yada, yada. Right. So, so when, the, when the probate code says it applies to proceedings limited to matters uh, within the state, to which the fiduciary is acting in a fiduciary capacity. It, is this a matter where the fiduciary capacity of the bank is at issue because it's not the beneficiary um, of the trust that's suing? The importance of the fiduciary relationship here is that the bank is acting in a fiduciary capacity as it is holding the securities, as it is holding the deeds of trust. The U.S. Bank owns the deed of trust executed by Dennis Moss, but it doesn't own it for its own behalf. It owns it on behalf of the certificate holders of this particular trust. So when Dennis Moss filed his lawsuit contesting the enforceability of the deed of trust, naming the holder of the deed of trust, which was U.S. Bank as trustee, 
U.S. Bank was not acting as holder of the deed of trust uh, on its own behalf. It was acting on behalf of the registered certificate holders of this mortgage backed trust. And so, therefore, when you look into the uh, the language of 505004, as uh, Justice Busby was noted, uh, was, was noting, uh, service on the Secretary of State as registered agent for the fidu foreign fiduciary is proper when the suit is regarding various things, including the other matters. And so when you review the analysis of the Second Court of Appeals in the NSL case, one of the arguments made by Bank of New York in that case was that the estate code doesn't apply because very similar kind of fact pattern contesting the enforceability of the deed of trust. Uh, Bank of New York was arguing the estate code didn't apply because this has got nothing to do with some sort of a traditional probate or estates matter. And the Second Court of Appeals went through the analysis of the language of the statute and it focused on the other matters language to, to conclude that you can't draw the estate code so narrowly because then what you're doing is vitiating the other matters portion of that. But the other matters is limited to those with respect to which the fiduciary is acting in a fiduciary capacity. Well, that's correct. Is but, that what the Court of Appeals in El Paso was getting at? Well, I, mean, I think what the Court of Appeals in El Paso was concluding without really analyzing the language of the, of the statutes was that because in that case it wasn't a probate type of a matter, where you were dealing with a testamentary trust or a living trust or that kind of a trust, it just doesn't apply. And so you have a difference of opinion between the uh, eighth court in that case and between the second and the fifth courts and, uh, and Judge Fitzwater in, uh, in these other cases. Uh, I would suggest, Your Honor, that the analysis of the eighth court is just wrong and that the analysis in the uh, NSL case, the analysis in uh, Justice Whitehill's opinion in this case, the analysis that Judge Fitzwater had in the remand order is uh, a much more thorough and cogent analysis, and I think it's supported by the uh, by just the language of the, uh, the the statutes and applying this court's rules of statutory construction, because there's uh, so so. Judge Fitzwater, I think, was one of the first to really address this in, in his opinion, and. His conclusion was that you've got 17.02a and you've got probate code 505 and that they're not mutually inconsistent. And his conclusion was that because the Secretary of State was the registered agent for U.S. Bank, service upon the registered agent of U.S. Bank being the Secretary of State was service in, that was consistent with 17.02a. So even if you were to say 17028 is the quote-unquote exclusive manner of service, which I disagree that it is because I think may means may, it doesn't mean shall, but that's another topic of conversation, that because the Secretary of State is the registered agent for service of process, then therefore service on the Secretary of State in this case was in fact consistent with 17028. Okay. Um, so... In, in looking at the history of these statutes, you've got probate code section 105A, of course, was enacted in 1961. 17.028 uh, was enacted, I believe, in 2007. 105A was then recodified as the estate code two years later, went into effect a few years after that. But this court has always said that it will presume that the legislature is aware of prior law as it creates new law or amends old law to create new provisions. I would suggest that if the legislature wanted to uh, make it the exclusive way to serve any kind of a bank in any kind of a capacity, that it be served according to the quote-unquote registered agent, and that 505 would not apply or 105A would not apply, then they would have said that. And that never happened. The Does D say that? 1017.028D? Saying that if citation hasn't been properly served as provided by this section, the financial institution can set the, the judgment aside. I don't think that has any applicability to the analysis of whether service was proper by serving the Secretary of State or not. 
I would also suggest that in a sense that that provision is somewhat redundant, because if any party is uh, suffers a default judgment and believes that it was improperly served with process, it has the remedy first of a restricted appeal for the first six months afterwards and then a uh, bill of review afterwards. And even if, uh, even though a bill of review has a four-year statute of limitations, if the issue is no service at all and a violation of due process, a default judgment could be collaterally attacked at any time. So I really don't think that the subpart D has any effect in this because if, in fact, the, let, let's say according to counsel's uh, argument, we should have served CT Corporation as the registered agent of U.S. Bank, um, well, then they have the remedy, of course, and the remedy is, in this case right now, the bill of review. And that leads me to another point, which I, I'd like to make here, uh, because counsel made this point, and he didn't make it in his brief, but he did make it an argument, and, and the court picked up on that. So, between 1961 and 2003, the designee for U.S. Bank, under the probate code filing, was Kristen Strong, or uh, uh, Kristen Strong of uh, 350 or 450 North Robert Street, St. Paul, Minnesota. That did not actually change until, I think, 2016, 17, 18. I'm not sure exactly when the designation changed. What they did do in 2013 was they changed the registered agent for service of process. There's a difference between a registered agent for service of process and a designee that the, Cer the Secretary of State looks to when trying to decide where do I send the citation and petition once I receive this uh, on behalf of a uh, foreign fiduciary corporation. So what CT Corporation said to the Secretary of State was, if we get sued, okay, our registered agent is CT Corporation. So if I want to sue U.S. Bank in its individual capacity for whatever reason, whether it's breach of contract or it holds a deed of trust that I want to challenge in its individual capacity, then I have it uh, in the public record that CT Corporation is their agent for service and process. That's completely different from the uh, estates code filing, because in the estates code filing, the registered agent irrevocably is the Secretary of State, and the, it's a two-step process, the second step being designating the person to whom process is to be forwarded. This is a point that was raised, actually, in the uh, federal district court in the remand, hearing, and what Judge, uh, Judge Fitzwater said, and I believe he's absolutely correct in this, is that there's a difference between the two, and that if U.S. Bank wanted to change its designation, it certainly has the capacity and the know-how, and certainly has the legal help to be able to file that particular document that says whenever we're sued as a foreign fiduciary, this is our designee, and in fact, they ultimately did do that a few years ago. It's a separate filing, it's a separate purpose, it's a separate person altogether. And I think to say that the fact that they changed their registered agent from Kristen Strong to um, CT Corp for purposes of registered agent appointment is sufficient to change their designee. It's just disingenuous and it flies in the face of, of uh, the statutory provisions. Uh, so I, I think there, there's, there's no merit whatsoever to that argument. Um, I think the court has the benefit of reasoned opinions, besides those of Mr. Cradiville and myself, as to what's the proper reading of these, these statutes. Um, I don't know that I could do a better job than uh, Justice Whitehill or Judge Fitzwater or the Second District Court of Appeals in, in the NSL case in explaining why it is the service under the estate code in this case was absolutely appropriate. The cases cited by uh, the petitioner, I think, are generally all easily distinguishable with the exception of the Chesapeake case, the uh, Eighth Court of Appeals case. Uh, the other cases have to do with situations where there were pleading deficiencies when the long-arm statute was being invoked. It has nothing at all to do with the issues before the court this morning. The case in the Eighth Court of Appeals is distinguishable on the facts, and I think it's uh, distinguishable uh, in, in terms of the analysis as well in a couple of important respects. So in that particular case, the uh, estates code was not invoked until the case got on appeal. In the trial court, I believe the 
allegations were that the registered agent for the defendant is this out-of-state person, so we want to serve the Secretary of State, so we'll then send it to the out-of-state person because they didn't have a, a Texas-designated registered agent. So mistakes were made in the way the pleadings were drawn, and I think the analysis, not the analysis, the uh, conclusion of the Court of Appeals was probably correct. The service was inadequate. But the reasoning on the estate's code was, I think, completely wrong. Uh, the Court of Appeals completely turned around the uh, Code Construction Act and redefined uh, may to mean shall. And it did not go through any kind of a rigorous analysis of the language of the estate's code or the interplay between the estate's code and the Civil Practice and Remedies Code as to why it is or is not. The service via the estate's code is proper. But in any event, they didn't even need to reach that in order to reach their opinion because the pleadings in that case did not invoke the estate's code whatsoever. This was an argument that was made just on appeal as an alternate way of justifying service by serving the Secretary of State to send the paperwork to the otherwise designated registered agent who was, I believe, in, uh, in the state of New York. So I think all of the authorities that are cited by petitioner in this case are either completely inept or, or distinguishable, but again, to the extent that the Eighth Court of Appeals provides some authority for their position, I think that the, uh, the opinion that you have in the NSL case followed by the uh, court below in this case is, is a much more sound, sound reason to pay. And with that, if there's no questions, I'll be happy to give the court back the balance of my time. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Crowder, you have five minutes. May it please the court. We cannot allow the exception to swallow the rule, and that is precisely the relief that respondent received by this end run around 17.028 using the estate code. Um, I don't want this court to lose the forest for, it, for the trees. As you all are well aware, Texas law abhors a default judgment, favors adjudication on the merits, and disfavors litigation uh, results based on technicalities. Here, as you've just heard counsel present, his best argument is the narrowest of technicalities. First, that the estate code applies to this non-estate case, where it's there is... I mean, the whole nature of service is technical. So why don't we have to look at what the legislature has provided and as far as different methods of service and decide which ones apply or no? Uh, ultimately, Justice Busby, I agree that is the task before this court. And I think when the court engages with the text of 17.028, as, uh, as I discussed in my opening, as well as with the legislative history laid out very nicely by the El Paso Court of Appeals in the Chesapeake case, it becomes clear that both in its text and in its legislative history, 17.028 was designed to cure a problem. It cured that problem. Very, very clever, very capable plaintiff's counsel have made an end run around it using the estate code. In well, I, I, I mean, there's no need to cast aspersions on anybody here. If they're using the statute in good faith, then, then we just need to decide whether it applies. I, I, I meant it as a compliment, actually, Your Honor, a capable counsel. Who, uh, but the, I, I suggested in my opening three ways that this interplay can work. And um, I think I got two of the three out. The first is the flat-out uh, exclusivity of 17.028, uh, which is the way the Tyler Court has gone, in which I think arguably the Chesapeake Court out of El Paso has gone as well. The second potential interplay would be that 505.004 uh, applies to fiduciary cases where there is an alleged fiduciary relationship between the parties are involving an estate. That's what's absent here. There is no estate or anything that would trigger the estate's code. This is uh, uh, a pool of uh, mortgages that investors invest in. That, that device didn't exist in 1961, and I don't think that's the fiduciary relationship contemplated by the estate's code. So limit 505.004 to the estate's code. The third where, where does it say, though, in, in 505.004.2 that the the action has to be for breach of the fiduciary 
relationship. Your, Your Honor, I'll concede that I don't think uh, that it's in there in the text. Uh, if you look at Clerk's Record 65, which is the probate code filing, that's the title of the document, that uh, U.S. Bank made back in 2001 when it uh, uh, gave this, this initial designation, the, the language tracks the statute and says something to the effect of uh, may be served in any action or proceeding relating to any trust, estate, fund, or other matter within this state with respect uh, to which such corporate fiduciary is acting in any fiduciary capacity. Um, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I wanted to hear your third point. The, the third one would be to allow the exception to swallow the rule and to give equal status in all cases where there is any sort of fiduciary relationship, any sort of trustee relationship, even if it's not between the parties, even if it's not alleged in the pleadings, uh, 2505.004a. And that's the result I urge this court to avoid because it will require legislative correction. Uh, just as the past tradition of taking default judgments against banks and other financial institutions required uh, legislative correction, if, if this court does not follow what the El Paso court has done in Chesapeake, what the Tyler court has done in Deutsche Bank, and the statutory construction that I've suggested for 17.028 as an exclusive means of service, at least outside of narrow fiduciary cases, uh, then um, this sort of, sort of thing where, where there are uh, strategic end runs and strategic uh, default judgments taken will, will unfortunately uh, continue and will uh, fly in the face of, of the well-established principle that Texas courts abhor default judgments. Um, U.S. Bank simply wants to stay in court. It's ready, willing, and able to defend against a meritless lawsuit. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Credible. The case is submitted. That concludes the arguments of the case is set for this morning. Marshall, would you All rise. Oye, oye, oye. The Honorable, the Supreme Court of Texas, now stands adjourned. <laughs>